This is the Open University. <laughs> Welcome back to the Open University. I thought I would extemporize this morning. It's a Monday morning here in Tokyo. Um, I'd extemporize, let there be light, on the theme of dandyism. Um, whether it's good to be a dandy, whether I am a dandy myself, um, the idea of the sacrificial dandy, which is something I've bandied around in my dandy way, to be an intellectual dandy, to be a physical dandy, to uh, wear women's clothes. This actually is a shirt I got in Sugamo yesterday. Sugamo is known as the uh, old lady Sarajuku. Um, it's a sort of fashion district for geriatrics, basically. So it suits me right down to the ground. And uh, what I love is rather unusual garments. This has got a certain puritanism, rounded, rather modest collar. This is a, a certain kind of underwear store that uh, elderly ladies frequent, uh, which has pyjamas and also housework clothes, shufu clothes as I call them, um, and um, the clothes connote a kind of virtue, they encode the idea of virtue. I suppose I really, that's one of the things I'm buying into when I look for my clothes, a kind of um, otherworldliness, because of course we live in a neoliberal dog-eat-dog kind of Hobbesian world, and uh, so the idea of some kind of self-abnegating virtue is appealing to me. Uh, maybe I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing, maybe I am a neoliberal and I've got this savage side to me, but uh, I, I like to actually dress like an old lady and, and, and like a Japanese old lady of the old school. So this striped shirt is a little bit me getting into that character. Um, usually, you know, more overt dandyism, uh, romantic exoticism, we're trying to dress like the other, the anthropological other, that's another element of my sartorial dandyism. Um, clothes, why are they important? Um, they're important to me to, uh, to you know, I, I was actually reading an article um, recently uh, in which somebody dreamt up these fancy terms for why people are collectors, why they collect things, and the terms were, uh, were all things like uh, relational uh, what was it? Uh, identity um, statements and, uh, uh, you know, these rather high highfalutin terms for quite obvious things, which is that you're, you're trying to distinguish yourself um, from the mass, the horde of other people, but also you're trying to, kind of, to, to encode affiliations with people that you do want to be seen with, groups, perhaps imaginary groups, perhaps um, fictional groups that you want to... I mean, I don't really have any friends who are these old ladies I dress like. I might buy a shirt with pockets in the side for the old lady to keep her... Um, I don't know what they keep in these. I suppose they keep their hands in, in these. Men are not really trusted to put their hands in the sides of their shirts. Men usually have a little pocket here. There's also some ruching. Um, some little stitching here which really does connote that there's a womb underneath. Possibly no longer in use if you're an old lady, but... Um, I suppose that stitching connotes that, but I, and that almost put me off buying it, actually. I just thought it was a striped shirt initially. Yeah, anyway, so um, it's fairly obvious why people... But then again, if I look around, I don't see anybody who's sort of playing the same games that I am sartorially. So uh, I'm a little bit confused about what I'm doing and what they're doing. Um, I'm interested in, you know, these owlish glasses. I'm interested in looking owlish, professorial... Um, nerdy. Um, the sacrificial dandy idea is something I applied specifically, I think, to somebody called Dickon Edwards, or at least I once warned him. He's a, a great sort of, uh, like a young version of Quentin Crisp. He was in a band years ago called Orlando, another band called Fosca. Um, then he went and studied English literature at Birkbeck College. Um, he dyes his hair um, peroxide and keeps a diary largely of a sort of rather solitary existence in North London bedsit. And uh, he's always, he always seems discouraged, but he's, he's very much in the tradition of, say, Kenneth Williams as a diarist, or a little bit Alan Bennett as well, uh, and definitely Quentin Crisp. So I think of all these people as, um, as far as I know, Dickens not gay. He's celibate, though. I think he's celibate, but not gay. 
Um, all these people are... It's, it's the consequence of living in a country like England, specifically. Um, I would say Britain, but I want to exempt Scotland and, and Ireland a bit from this. Um, England has no real rapport with the dandies. Um, and as happens often with very conservative countries, you have a little... Um, so the eye of the storm... Um, where there is, an, there is an idea of dandyism. Obviously, you just sit well and people like that. Even Lord Byron or, you know, poets can be dandies and, and eccentrics. But um, generally, they are all uh, rebelling in the same ways against the kind of norms which are oppressing them. And um, this goes back to the idea I was discussing recently about whether you can really be outside of your times, whether simply by having an opinion which is against the... the zeitgeist. You can resist the zeitgeist, and I, my answer to that is in the negative, really. I think that even by resisting, especially by resisting the zeitgeist, you are capitulating to it, because your every waking thought, and possibly your dreams as well, will be occupied by the zeitgeist, by whatever is going on at the moment. It's like trying to pretend that Trump doesn't exist, um, or, or attacking Trump directly, or, you know, just ignoring, you know, there's actually software which I've installed in my Chrome browser, which um, stops Twitter from actually mentioning Trump. It simply says in square brackets, this tweet is about the 2016 election. Anytime you get any mention of Trump or the current political batch. Um, so I've um, tried to... Uh, by the way, these demons that follow me around, non sequitur, um, they're actually bean demons, which uh, you throw beans at to exercise them for your house. But they've kind of become my friends, and they used to sit on the computer monitor, the broken computer monitor behind me in the old broadcast from last year. So I thought I'd reintroduce them uh, as kind of uh, kind of yes men. Perhaps you can imagine them saying yes, yes, yes to everything, that, uh, agreeing to everything, uh, with everything that I'm saying. Uh, a bit like those Chris Evans yes men, or the sort of British uh, radio personality yes men. Um, so yeah, to me, it's um, being the sacrificial dandy is being someone who is um, who is basically living out a in themselves the national distaste for eccentricity and dandyism. Dandyism is the flamboyant end of eccentricity. You can obviously be um, in various ways handicapped mentally, physically, and be um, an outsider. You can be uh, a non-capitulant, you can be someone who doesn't basically knuckle down to the values and norms of your society. Um, but to be a dandy as well is to to dare to be flamboyantly non-conformist. And uh, of course there's the irony that uh, non-conformity is just extreme individuality and we live in an individualistic culture. Um, and therefore to be a flamboyant nonconformist is uh, is actually not to rebel very strongly against that individualistic culture anyway um, here in uh, here for me in Japan to be um, flamboyant really rebelling against a youth culture dominated uh, uh, fashion industry for instance which would decree that I even as a middle aged person I should be wearing trainers and getting down with the kids and you know doing street art spraying illegal street art, which later will get uh, endorsed by the authorities and I'll be doing it for money for some sort of festival. Um, all that sort of thing. There's this endless, endless series of collapsing um, paradoxes when it comes to what is a rebel, what's a conformist, this year's rebellion, last year's conformism, whatever. Norm core. Uh, it's endless. Somebody, somebody actually, uh, Mark Fisher believed this, but somebody also was theorizing recently about this, saying that fashion has ended. There is no more uh, of this kind of, even the cycles of revival or the ideas of uh, of there being specific hipster trends, you know, the, the whole thing of hipsters, blah, 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 has kind of ended. Uh, it ended in about 2010, possibly, or 20, 2008 with the financial collapse. There hadn't, you don't really see new styles or, you know, new, new um, subcultures springing up in the same way that you did. And uh, I think the times we live in are uniquely conformist, and there's a kind of, the wind has gone out of the sails of that idea of revolution through style, um, which in itself always seemed politically rather suspect. Why not actual 
have an actual revolution rather than simply these endless revolutions of style. Um, but, you know, some of us would love to see bloody, the bloody Gallagher brothers displaced by some kind of punk movement which would absolutely despise them, which would make them look like pathetic old farts. Um, we would love to see a major... But, you know, music has lost the ability to, to, to power these social uh, changes. And... Um, I suppose the, revol the revolutions are all happening in business, on the internet, whatever, you know, Grab taking over from Uber in Southeast Asia, that was a bit of a revolution. Um, there are all sorts of technological things happening, but um, I soldier on in my own particular dedication to uh, my own particular set of styles. I, I said uh, recently in one of these talks that I think um, 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 what did I say? I said that um, Well, I said in, in my uh, Instagram, uh, Pracy, I've written that article now, the essay about Instagram, um, Instagenic, um, I said that I, my own gestures become a sort of repertoire of cliches within my own standard of what a cliche is. They're not cliches for other people. Um, so, uh, An angel passeth in my thought process. Uh, there was a, there was a, I was, there was somewhere I was going with that. Um, God, this doesn't happen on the real open university, does it? Uh, the real open university was something almost dandyish in its own way. I think that's what I liked: the floral shirts and things of the uh, the lecturers, who were simply expressing nineteen seventies values. Um, Dandyism. To me, and this is also something I've spoken about before, but to me, being a dandy is also connected to being a, um, to being chivalric, to having a sense of honour, uh, which is encoded in your, that your style is not just about visual things. It, it encodes visually a much deeper and more thoroughgoing code the chivalric code is just just a metaphor, really, or it could be a code of honour. But I, in my mind, for instance, why do I wear mostly women's clothes or sort of clothes that can be worn by women? These are sort of Japanese. There's a certain kunel. I, I, I would have called it the kunel look, except kunel magazine has now been reformatted and is, is boring and mainstream, but it used to have a certain look. Same with RNA magazine, which also closed down recently. There's a look, these are magazines targeted at middle-aged Japanese women who um, have a certain sense of style, but also uh, encode virtue. It's, a, it's the style of virtue, and that interests me a lot because it's, it seems very much against the grain of the culture I know, which is this individualistic Western culture. Um, so uh, the people actually who are running this house have, have this style to some degree, and they're selling the clothes downstairs in the pottery showroom, which go with it, uh, which is sort of indigo-dyed T-shirts, sort of tie-dyed T-shirts and um, aprons and houseware, workwear, all connected to pottery, the kind of clothes you could be making pots while wearing. Um, I suppose I'm very enthusiastic about that. The same way that I'm sort of interested in British culture from the mid-20th century, where there was a very um, a certain look of aprons and headscarves and, uh, um, yeah, a, a certain encoding of, of virtue. Whereas now we, we all try to look like hoodlums and street criminals, and that is our idea of uh, Oshare style, uh, fashionable style. So I don't know. Um, dandyism, it's, it's, it, is, it does seem to be an ethical duty, and it's connected to a whole ethical package, in my mind anyway. Um, and uh, by dressing like a better person, a more selfless person, the paradox is that I'm being kind of flamboyantly selfish or uh, um, a bit of a one-off, you know, dressing like this, but... Um, I like to encode selflessness uh, as a, a moral, as an ethical gesture, um, which goes beyond mere style. Yeah. Um, 
So dandyism could be it could be connected to some sort of code, if not a chivalric code, then a, a code of bushido, you could say. You know, a sort of dutiful code of stoicism in um, in medieval Japan. Bushido, mostly a code for men, it has to be said, it's a warrior code, but uh, if Bushido has a, a female component, it would be all about duty and self-sacrifice and uh, these very unfashionable values. Um, I suppose you could say <clears throat> he's a hypocrite because he's wearing these clothes and he's not actually doing the housework. He's, he's wearing housework clothes. He's not actually cleaning up the house very much. Um, and that would be, you know, a valid criticism. Um... But all is theatre, uh, and you, you're really allowed to, I think you're allowed to um, to not walk it like you talk it, um, and nevertheless make a political gesture by putting your, state, your visual statements in that area. Um, a gesture of solidarity with the people who genuinely are doing the housework and are in that area. Uh, but also a kind of a fuck you gesture to um, to <laughs> paradoxically to to the macho people who are saying fuck you back already, always and forever saying fuck you. Um, it doesn't feel right to be dressed like this and 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 have the lecturer's horn rimmed glasses on and be making rude gestures. I have to say, lexical clangers here, things which are out of the set, uh, very similitude. So, dandyism, dandyism, the sacrificial dandy, self-sacrifice um, to say, visually almost to say, overlook me please, or bully me, kick me please, you know, it's like putting a kick me sign on, on, that's the sacrificial dandy, somebody who, whilst knowing that the values they're about to embrace are uh, hated by the English, for instance, nevertheless embraces them fully because there is a tradition of embracing these hated values. You see, the English, because they've selected certain values and left other values to the French, for instance, historically, like the values of sexiness and culture, art, artiness, pretentiousness, these were all considered French values. Um, they've uh, kind of left a kind of little dressing up trunk of, oh, this is how you dress pretentiously. You know, you don't wear your football strip. <laughs> you wear... You wear sort of rough collars and things like that. Um, so there is, you know, even things seen as French are actually English French. You know, they're, they're, they're neglected English virtues of a possible alternative England. This is another very important point, that you dress for the parallel world you would like to see and to be in. And uh, so when I walk down the street, I want people to think, well, there's an interesting guy, but more importantly, what would the world be like in which he was the norm? Um, this is the idea of every lie creates the parallel world in which it's true. You could say every uh, exception creates the parallel world in which it is the norm. We don't have to talk about lies anymore. We just talk about unusual and exceptional things. And that's always been exciting. And sometimes you simply extrapolate incorrectly you see somebody who's actually coming from an existing subculture, a particular city, a society, and you extrapolate it to something totally wrong. Like I did this when I was in Yangon. I saw these guys in white makeup and uh, sarongs, longi skirts, and I, I thought of new romanticism. That was the, the main connector I, I had in you know my Western experience was, oh yeah, that moment when Malcolm McLaren and a few other people decided to dress up like uh, romantic tribesmen and savages and pirates and things. That was the moment our culture did something close to that. But of course the people in Myanmar are not um, thinking that way at all. That's their, they, they put that white stuff on their face to keep their skin clean and also it's cooling in hot weather. Uh, and the lungi is just how they've always dressed and it's uh, very practical gear for that uh, Climate. Of course, the colours are not determined by the climate. There's very bright um, tartans that they tend to like very much. That's not, um, you know, that's, you could say there's a connection between warm temperatures and warm colours. Um, so, but I kind of like extrapolating wrongly 
to this world where there's a whole country which is still still a new romantic, but has always been new romantic and predated the new romantic movement in the British fashion scene. They didn't have to read the face, you know, in 1980 to become new romantics. They they already had been since you know for hundreds of years. So yeah, I I think it's important to inject an element of fantasy uh, and and uh, this clash um, whereby you know splice is splice use use reality as an editing table. Uh, you can bring things down which all work within their context, but then when you splice them together in new ways and in congruous ways, you will create interest and you will create little bubbles above people's heads in which they're thinking, what world is that from? Or what two worlds is that splicing? Or um, they probably won't even think that this is two worlds. They'll, they'll just think, wow, that, that guy's from a different world. Um, and that could that will make you marginal automatically you know if you if I turn up for work dressed like this you know I don't know what work it would be perhaps it'd be housework um, if I turn up for housework dressed up like, dressed like this um, they'll think well he's the wrong type of person to be dressed like that he's not a housewife you know um, but as a pure style statement um, it um, I think it makes people dream I think dandyism simply makes people dream, and uh, it's always nice to it's nice to not quite understand your dreams and to see things which could be part of a dream that you didn't quite understand but were resonant somehow. Um, I don't like things making sense too quickly, but I do have to admit that commercially, and in terms of making first impressions on kind of normal people, it's quite important to to not have these mixed messages and not have these contradictions encoded in you. So if I were a businessman, I probably wouldn't um, be a dandy at the same time, unless I were trying to sell things to dandy-friendly people. That's all I'm going to say today.